accidents who say that if they've got cars on both sides of the roads, if there was an emergency, you could not get an ambulance down there if necessary. Mm, okay. But it, it's, it's, uh, cultural change is, is kind of an easy, easy sidestep often, but it does, is actually necessary because the, Janice says, you know, people don't understand how much we love our cars. Actually, the, the reason why the park and rides all over Auckland are full is because people have, they, they were nervous about whether Aucklanders would buy into public transport, so they built smallish park and rides not to overspend. People have actually gone in great numbers onto public transport and the park and rides are full. Mm. So we do actually need to accept that people don't necessarily love their cars and do want public transport. We have to put the facilities around it for them. Is there any bicycle parking? Um, I'm just trying to think now. I don't. No, I don't think there is in the park and ride. It's all cars. The last time I was down there, ah. it's purely cars. Interestingly enough, I understand that in Papakura, they're going to build a um, a park and ride building. Good. But they're not doing it in Papatote. So, as I said, there are a number of us who are still advocating for that because we would like to see people use the public uh, transport more often. Mm. I mean, I actually... I'm, I don't live in Papatote now, but I did for years, and... I come to my council office there, and on a normal, say, Sunday morning, um, I can take me 15 minutes to get to Papatoto. Yesterday, with the board meeting, it took me the same journey, took me 50 minutes. And what we're seeing is there, um, the figures being bandied around, is that there are 400 people per week are moving into Auckland. Yeah. And the roads can't handle it. No. All right. Uh, Ross, thank you for your expertise and your local knowledge. Ross Robertson. Which is why we need people to get on bikes. <sighs> it's the quandary, though, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. It is the quandary. Especially because it's so example. far away, like, you know, to get anywhere from yeah. there. I don't have time to ask you about the tale of two maonga today, but never mind. I'll ask you whether this makes you wonder about legalising recreational cannabis. <laughs> U.S. <laughs> research from Columbia University, cannabis use by mothers and fathers rose from 11% in 2002 to 17% in 2015. Cannabis use among parents with children still at home rose from 5% to 7 Not as much. Uh, the discussion they're having at Columbia is all about the effects on the lungs and the heart and the second-hand cannabis smoke. But I thought I'd ask you about the example that parents... A setting. Would you have wanted mum and dad toking away in the lounge no, when you were small? No, they quit no. smoking when I was sort of eight and ten because my grandmother died slowly and painfully from emphysema. So that put the end to smoking in our household. And I wouldn't want any smoke ever inside, ever. I hate smoking. Cannabis or tobacco? Yeah, I hate smoking, regardless. Yeah. No, as a child, my, my dad smoked all my childhood. I used to, you know, pop down the dairy to buy him his, his yeah. cigarettes as a kid. Um, and, you know, welcome to my asthma world. So, yeah, um, snap. I've got asthma too. Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, I mean, yeah. So, put yourself together, parents. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't Show have a problem legalising cannabis. Situ- I mean, like, we trust parents to supposedly not smoke around their kids now, yeah. you know. So, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the but same issue to me, just a different source of, of smoke. Yeah, smoke is bad. Yeah, smoke is bad. Just add cookies. Make make little brownies. <laughs> make brownies and do lots of colouring in with your children. That'd be exciting, wouldn't it? <laughs> Psychedelic, maybe. Possibly don't do drugs with your children around is more to the point. Maybe be careful with the baking of the, what the children yeah. are baking. Yes, I thought yeah, for a couple right. of alarming moments you were recommending. You were <laughs> no. going down a path we Definitely not. didn't no, want to go down. You should use you know, responsible drug use. <laughs> That's right. Particularly with for the kids, something yes. else for the kids. Yeah, cocaine, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's all good. It's all good. Don't say that. Oh, stop. Penny Ashton. Penny Ashton's been on Quick, the panel today. Quick, go to today. checkpoint. Go to checkpoint. <laughs> uh, thank you, Penny. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. And Tim Watkin has been on with us today as well. Thanks, Tim. Cheers, Jim. We're back tomorrow. Thanks for your company, everybody. And Checkpoint, in fact, uh, with John Campbell, comes up now. Thank you for joining us on Checkpoint tonight. A former Gloria Vale member says his family and friends have been sexually abused by members of the community. David Reddy said he was expelled from the community 18 months ago for confronting the spiritual leader, Hopeful Christian, about his criminal past. He also says he confronted other leaders who knew abuse was happening but did nothing to stop it. Hopeful Christian died yesterday at the age of 92. Also tonight, 17 of New Zealand's largest retail chains have now been accused of forcing their employees to work without pay. We have the latest from Zach Fleming. A red alert issued as Hawaii's Kilauea volcano releases more toxic gases. And is $650,000 affordable for a first home? 
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Bat and Aho. An organisation helping first home buyers says the government's cap for affordable homes in Auckland is still challenging. The government's Kiwi Build programme aims to build 100,000 affordable houses over the next decade. A three bedroom home in Auckland would cost $650,000. The Housing Minister, Phil Twyford, has admitted it's still too much for many people. Leslie Harris from the online help organisation, the First Home Buyers Club, says it's a significant cost and banks are also tight on lending. For somebody to afford you know, a $650,000 home, they've got some savings, they've got KiwiSaver, let's say they're needing to borrow, say, you know, 500000 or just over, they're going to need approximately $115,000 income plus no debt plus no student loans in order to have to get the finance to afford that home. Leslie Harris says people are having to get creative to afford housing. A coroner says continued teasing and taunting at school laid the foundation for a Hutt Valley teen suicide. Kala Nanagata has released her findings into the death of 15-year-old Anthony Song, who died in August 2015. Documentation from Hutt Valley High painted Anthony Song as the, as the instigator in altercations with other students. However, the coroner says it appears he was frequently the target of teasing and taunting. She says his outbursts were likely to have been a response to that provocation. The coroner says the fact his behaviour may have cost him his place in the school's top maths class and the fear that would be disappointing to his parents may have been the tipping point in driving him to take his own life. A former Gloria Vale member says family and friends have been sexually abused by members of the community. David Reddy also says that one of his abusers was the leader, convicted sex offender, Hopeful Christian. Christian, also known as Neville Cooper, died yesterday at the age of 92. David Reddy says he was expelled from Gloria Vale in 2016 after confronting Christian about his criminal past and other leaders about sexual assaults. Mr Reddy says they knew about the abuse but refused to take action. There'll be more from David Reddy on Checkpoint after this bulletin. Employers are being warned to pay the minimum wage or face a knock on the door from labour inspectors. A workers advocate says some of the 600 jobs advertised on the Backpacker Board website are paying below $16.50 per hour. Chloe Ann King has publicly shamed employers on social media, including some in farming, and is encouraging people to call them up and complain. The Workplace Relations Minister Ian Lees Galloway says employers must follow the law and meet their obligations. Labour inspectors are proactively looking through these websites, looking out for this sort of thing, and if they do breach the law, they can expect to get a phone call. Ian Lees Galloway says he's getting more advice on the advertisements. Activist Penny Bright will meet with the Auckland Council in a last-ditch attempt to stop the sale of her home. The High Court is managing the forced sale of Ms Bright's home to recover 11 years of unpaid rates, penalties and legal costs amounting to nearly $90,000. The High Court today dismissed her attempt to halt the court-ordered sale process while a judicial hearing is carried out. Ms Bright says she'll consider entering into an arrangement which would defer the rates payment until she sells or passes away. I feel is that I'm under total duress, but this rating sale, as far as I'm concerned, it can't continue, and I've arranged to have a meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock with Auckland Council. The council says it would prefer for Ms Bright to stay in her home and says it looks forward to meeting with her. The jailed former Malaysian Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim has been granted a full pardon and has walked free from a Kuala Lumpur hospital where he's been undergoing treatment. Malaysia's King Mohammed has wiped all past convictions for Mr Anwar, who was twice jailed on charges his supporters say were politically motivated. The BBC's Jonathan Head is in Kuala Lumpur. He spent two periods in prison as a result of his opposition to the ruling party. He's had to remain in prison, although he's been in hospital lately, watching his party come together with Dr Mahathir again and inflict this extraordinary defeat. It was a condition of his arrangements with Dr Mahathir that he would push for his release. Malaysia's constitutional monarch has issued that pardon uh, about an hour and a half ago. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim is out and in fact he's in the palace behind me now having a meeting with the king. Jonathan Head in Kuala Lumpur. It's five minutes past five. 
Sport, Tana Umanga has signed for another year as head coach at the Blues and will be joined by former All Blacks teammate Leon McDonald as assistant. McDonald, a former Crusaders assistant, is current head coach of Tasman in the National Provincial Championships. The Blues have won just three of their 11 games this Super Rugby season, but Umanga says the faith the franchise have in him is a reflection of the foundation he's built and will continue to grow. On the face value right now, it's probably not uh, that's something that I suppose is, is seen as the most deserving uh, position, but for us that are here and that all that work that's been put in behind the scenes, the structures and the systems that we've put in place, I think it is a testament to that faith that's been put in myself and, and what we've done, so I'm very happy about that. Tana Umanga. The Southern Steel will be looking to return to winning ways when they host the Waikato Bay of Plenty, Plenty Magic in the ANZ Premiership tonight. The Steel, the Steel suffered at their first loss in 17 games last week to the Central Pulse while the Magic welcome back South African shooter Lenise Potigida in search of their first win of the 2018 season. Aston Villa beat Middlesbrough 1-0 on aggregate after a nil-all draw at Villa Park to seal their place in the English Championship football playoff final where they'll meet Fulham. Villa are one match away from returning to the Premier League from which they were relegated in 2016. The playoff final will be held at Wembley Stadium on May the 26th. That's the news. Grant Robertson delivers the first budget of the Labour-led coalition government tomorrow. We'll bring you his budget speech live here on RNZ National at 2 o'clock. And as it's read, we'll have up-to-the-minute analysis from our political editor Jane Patterson and our team of specialist correspondents. After nine straight budgets from National, what will be different this time? Join me, Susie Ferguson, from 2 o'clock on Thursday afternoon to find out here on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. For all of the North Island except for Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, showers, some heavy and isolated thunderstorms easing tomorrow. Becoming fine from tomorrow afternoon about Bay of Plenty and Taupo and from Horafenua to Wellington and Wairarapa. For Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, a few showers about the ranges, otherwise mostly fine. For Nelson and Buller, rain with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms clearing this afternoon, but a few showers remaining about Buller and Western Nelson. For Westland and Fiordland, mainly fine in Westland today. Showers in Fiordland spreading north tomorrow. Marlborough and Canterbury, rain about and north of Christchurch and a few showers elsewhere. All clearing early tomorrow morning and becoming fine. Otago and Southland, showers retreating to coastal Southland tonight, then spreading north into Southland for a time tomorrow afternoon. And for the Chatham Islands, occasional showers clearing later tomorrow. It's coming up to eight minutes past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. Thank you everyone for being with us on the programme tonight. Will the Provincial Growth Fund be enough for Minganui? The BBC's Jeremy Bowen from Jerusalem and Gaza and 17 of New Zealand's largest retail chains have now been accused of forcing their employees to work without pay. Zach Fleming's been doing good work on this and we have more coming up. But first tonight, a former Gloria Vale resident expelled from the religious community in punishment for questioning elders has told Checkpoint he knows of multiple cases of sexual abuse there. David Reddy was 17 when he was thrown out of his lifelong home in 2016. He's 19 now and following the death yesterday of community leader and founder, convicted sex offender Neville Cooper, he's spoken out about what he calls a brutal regime of indoctrination and control, which saw people told the consequence of disobedience was hell, and anyone who repeatedly questioned community leaders being evicted, even if their entire family was there. Mr Reddy says he knows people who were sexually abused at Gloria Vale, and he believes community leaders knew the abuse was happening. Nobody from Gloria Vale would speak with us about this today. Two years after he was evicted from Gloria Vale with just $700 and a one-way plane ticket, David Reddy says he hopes the death of the man who called himself Hopeful Christian will be the catalyst for family members still there to leave the community. David's mother was Hopeful Christian's stepdaughter and David says he's desperate to see her again. I spoke to David Reddy earlier this afternoon and he told me about realising he'd been lied to his whole life and trying to learn the truth. I basically wanted information on Hopeful's criminal past. I wanted to know if it was true because I'd been told as a kid growing up that it wasn't true and then I'd found out it was true. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like and I did not appreciate being lied to. 
So, so Neville Cooper, hopeful Christian, went to prison in 1995 for sexual abuse. What Correct. What were you told about that? That the trial was rigged, that the witnesses were false witnesses, that they told lies, they, they took evidence right out of context and fabricated a false story. And on their false accusations, he was sent to jail. That's what I was told. And do you think most people in the community believed that? Um, I'd say there'd be a fair percentage that would believe that. So they didn't know their leader and a man in whom a great deal of faith was placed had served a term of imprisonment for sexual abuse. Yeah, they, they knew he had served the term. They just believed that he was wrongly, uh, wrongly convicted. David, can I go back to a couple of words you used earlier on? Uh, you, you said physical discipline when you were little. What, what did that consist of? Oh, basic smackings and, yeah, just like basic discipline as children growing up, just nothing out of the ordinary. And then you said as you got older, you used the word brutal, but you were talking about mind stuff. Can you elaborate on that for me? What did that consist of? How did that work? Uh, so basically, if you do not do what you're told, um, you're getting a first-class ticket straight to hell. And the only way to get out of that is to do what you're told and submit. So I've got a very, very heavy indoctrination of fear and hell to push their agenda. And that's pretty powerful and persuasive when that is your life. There are no other viewpoints being expressed. There is no way to hear other voices. There is no alternative reality. That is the totality of what you're being told if you dare to question the leaders. Exactly. Like you've been raised from day one learning about God, learning, learning about heaven, learning about hell. So as, as a young child and you know, early teens being spoken to quite forcefully about the reality of hell and if you do not do this you are going there it's and you've got nothing else to level it off or to compare it against your your mind just has no nothing to combat that with and so you you buckle and you bend are you scared yeah there's, there's a lot of fear um uh, many times, um, I remember, you know, the sick feeling in your gut of fear as a child when hearing those things. And, yeah, uh, basically they try and drill it into you as children, and so like, all their prep work is done for when you're an adult, and you, then you, you know, follow the carrot like a donkey. And fall into line. Yeah, just like they don't, they don't like problem people. They don't like people that ask more than their share of questions. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to ask you a question, and you are absolutely uh, able to say no to me. So I don't want in any way, shape, or form to put any words in your mouth, right? And and it's really important. You tell me your truth. Do you yeah. do you believe? there was or has been sexual abuse in Gloria Vale. Yes, I, I know that for a fact, an undisputable, undeniable fact. And, and how do you know that? It's happened to my friends, it's happened to some of my family members. Yeah. And I know it's happened, and I know the people that did it, I know when it happened. Did the leaders know? The leaders knew everything. And they refused to take action. Did Hopeful Christian know? He knew. 
but please tell me the truth here as well as you are able to. Don't let me put words in your mouth, but was he involved in any of it as far as you're aware? He was involved in one. And when I found out about it, I was not a happy boy. Why did you leave? I was kicked out for asking too many questions and demanding too many answers. And who kicked you out? How does that, what happens, David? How does that take place? I saw I was called into a meeting. It was about nine o'clock on a Friday night. It's, it's called a Service and Shepherds meeting. Acronym is SS, SS meeting. So I was called in there and basically sat down and it's like 16 against one in there. I was 17, so, you know, I didn't stand much of a chance of holding any kind of ground. And they basically just ripped me to pieces. They they sit there and basically take turns at um, destroying your character, destroying everything that you can use against them, and they preempt your answers before you even answer them because they've had hundreds of people in those meetings. So, yeah, you're just like a fish in a barrel surrounded by cats. And basically, we were just arguing about things that I thought were wrong and they were just repeating that I had no right to ask ask those questions and they didn't want me around the young people, they didn't want me there and eventually they told me to go. And yeah, the next day they booked me a flight to Napier and sucked me on a plane. And prior to that Friday night and the next day, that Saturday, that had been your entire life? Correct. F family there, siblings, parents? Yep. Whole life, everything I knew. And you were 17 and you were tossed out? Yep. I was given $700, I think. Right then, that was heaps to me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a sense uh, from Facebook that it was heartbreakingly difficult to say goodbye to your mum. Is that the case? That was the worst. That was... Yeah, you never know what you've got till you have to put it down. But yeah, I mean, I love, I love my mum and I always will. And yeah, that was, that was one of the hardest and so... Yeah, that took a bit to get used to. Um, um, I'll always be a mama's boy and I'm proud of it. Yeah. So where did you go at 17 in Napier with $700? Um, my aunt from Gisborne drove down, uh, good old Auntie Jackie, <laughs> and picked me up and took me to Gizzy. Uh, she had a job there and I stayed with her for a while and then I applied for a few jobs and I got a job on a dairy farm in Topol working for a guy. I was a Christian man. Um, yeah, and him and his wife were really good to me. They gave me a lot of um, support, a lot of time to talk to them about my life and yeah, they were very, very supportive people and I'm very grateful for everything they did to me and yeah, um, worked there for about eight months, just learning today's world, today's society, and yeah, had, it was just a massive learning experience, and I made some really good friends in Topol, really good people, and yeah, they taught me a lot, and yeah, that was basically my introduction to the modern world. And how did you find it, the modern world? What was it like? Um, to, to be honest, um, it was a lot like Glorabelle. <laughs> not not exactly the control, but the same type of people I met and knew in Glorabelle. I met the same type of people 
down here. And I, I thought it was going to be massively different. There was going to be a huge change, but I found out um, it was a lot harder. A lot harder to, to figure things out. You had to be a, a lot more proactive and interactive with people. And, yeah, I guess there was a lot of fun just learning, basically learning a new a new skill that I had never had to even know about before. Just interacting with new people mm. and learning new things, being willing to adapt to new situations. And when you heard Neville Cooper, hopeful Christian, had died, what was is your response? Um, uh, relief, initially relief. Uh, my family's just a tiny bit safer and also uh, a humbling and a, like a very maturing and thought-provoking mentality that, you know, you can try and swing numbers in your favour, you can brainwash people, you can bully them, you can manipulate them into getting what you want. You can create your false reality, but eventually death, death visits everyone and when death comes knocking on your door, you have to answer. And that's complete reality. It's like there's no, there's nothing fake about death. You cannot run from it. You cannot hide from it. And in life, I believe he just ran from a lot of things. He covered up a lot of things. And he would not to admit to a lot of things. But now, now he's facing complete reality of death. Do you think that people will come out now? Do you think your friends and family who are still in there and who you clearly love uh, will start to think about leaving Gloria Vale as a result of, of Neville Cooper, hopeful Christian dying? Unfortunately, I don't think there will be any major immediate change. Um, there will be still a lot of respect there for hopeful there'll be a lot of loyalty for him and I think they'll use him a lot to motivate and control people. You know, they'll use his memory, his legacy, let's let's do this and honour him to to keep the place going for a while and eventually that will that will phase out. But yeah, I don't I can't see any immediate change at this stage happening. What would you like to say to the people you love who are still in there? I'm coming to see you next week. Will I let you in? Um, they can't stop me. <clears throat> and what are you going to do when you go? I'm going to go see my mother and take her a belated Happy Mother's Day gift. Former Gloria Vale community member David Reddy. Nobody from Gloria Vale itself would comment today. We wanted to talk to them about those allegations from David of sexual abuse. Uh, no one will talk to us. West Coast Police Area Commander Jackie Corner says a multi-agency approach to safety within the community has been adopted at Gloria Vale and regular visits are made to the community by police and also in a multi-agency-led approach which includes Oranga Tamariki, District Health Board and the Ministry of Education staff. She says the police continue to work with the Gloria Vale leadership team to assist in providing advice and support. Let's move on. 17 of New Zealand's largest retail chains have now been accused of forcing their employees to work part of their day without pay. Collectively, we're talking tens of thousands of employees and potentially millions of dollars in unpaid wages. After Smith City was told by the Employment Court on Friday to back pay its employees for six years of unpaid daily 15-minute morning meetings, we've been inundated with texts and emails from listeners saying the same thing is or has happened to them. Unions have received thousands of complaints. The government's received hundreds. Both are warning retailers they'll investigate all of them. We have been following up your texts and going to the companies that you have named most often. Tonight, we have a story of a woman who was effectively fired for speaking out against the practice. Forced to go to morning meetings unpaid at Bunnings Warehouse, she objected and stopped getting work. We continue Zach Fleming's series on underpay in the workplace, and Zach's been working with visual journalist Nick Monroe. 
Lowest prices are just the beginning. And the end for one Bunnings Warehouse employee was stress, anxiety and despair. I started not getting as many offers of shift and then I just got no offers and then I resigned. All because she simply asked to get paid for the work she was doing. We aren't naming her, but she worked at two Bunnings Warehouse stores leaving at the beginning of this year. She tried to push back against unpaid morning meetings. I was told that if I didn't show up for morning meetings, uh, my contract would be terminated because it showed I wasn't on board. Um, and she said that coming in early showed that you were committed and um, that commitment was sort of indicative of, you know, <laughs> um, your attitude and also would, like, affect how, how many shifts you got because I was on a casual contract at that point. So, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would you say that you felt like that was a threat, come into the morning meeting or else? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, essentially it was a threat, and the threat got carried through. Her work dried up, so she moved to a different Bunnings warehouse. There, she was paid for the morning meeting, but not paid for her evening cash-up. The store would officially close at 6, but... Often there'd be customers still in the store and I couldn't start cashing up until all the customers had left. I wouldn't finish until 6.30, um, or sometimes later, and I wasn't paid for that. And, um, and what I started doing was I started changing my timesheet, you know, saying, noting it and saying, I got out at 6.30 because of late cash up, and, but that wasn't reflected on my payslip. Bunnings Warehouse declined to be interviewed, but in a statement it said it expects staff to be paid for all meetings and cash up, and will investigate any claims that arise. The retail sector right across New Zealand is getting millions of dollars in free labour every year, cheating a minimum wage worker out of at least 15 minutes work a day through compulsory unpaid meetings or cash up equates to $800 a year. And so far the list of businesses accused of doing that is long. First Union says it's received hundreds of complaints from employees from Smith City, Spotlight, Briscoe's, Hannah's, Rebel Sport, The Warehouse, Countdown, Pack and Save, Cotton On, Noel Leeming, Harvey Norman, Farmers, Kmart, Whitkills and Warehouse Stationery. And checkpoints heard from more than 100 workers from dozens of other businesses too. We've had about 1,500 respondents to our survey. Tali Williams from First Union says their 0800 number's been ringing off the hook. The line has been drawn in the sand now that employers um, you know, can't hide from the fact that they must pay their, their workers for all hours worked um, and not to try to make people come in to work for free. Um, it's now been established that's clearly illegal um, and, and we will pursue those cases. And so will the government. Labour Inspectorate Regional Manager Stu Lumsden says their 0800 numbers seen a 15% rise in complaints this week. We'll then try and group them into industries or employers and then we'll be going out um, once we have that information to those uh, industries and employers uh, to try and get them to rectify uh, the issue. If at the end of that we've still got employers who are not compliant, we will be visiting them. Workplace Relations Minister Ian Lees Galloway says he's committed to doubling the number of labour inspectors to 110 to try and keep businesses honest. After the budget's released tomorrow, we'll know how many will come in its first year. And the other thing I'd say to the workers in this situation is this is exactly what unions are for. I don't think this situation would have been allowed to carry on for as long as it has if more of the workforce had been unionised. So it's a good example of why being a member of a union uh, can be very, very helpful to a lot of workers. The Bunnings warehouse worker you heard from wasn't in a union. After she tried but failed to be paid for cash up, she dropped it. You're immediately made aware that you're not important and that you're so easily replaceable and that can be very depressing. First Union says it will continue to name and shame companies in the coming days. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. You are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Thank you so much for being with us. Coming up on the programme before six, a pilot in China is being hailed a hero for safely landing a plane after the co-pilot was half sucked out of the windscreen. Absolutely terrifying media drama. Uh, Palestinians bury their dead after Israeli forces killed up to 60 people uh, along the Gaza-Israel border. We have the latest from the BBC's Jeremy Bowen, who is there. 
And uh, the Provincial Growth Fund, will it work in a community like uh, the Bay of Plenty Forestry Village, Minganui? We wanted to find out how it's going to be spent and what difference it will make. Uh, so we went there. All of that coming up before six. We'd love your feedback and Gloria Vale and working for free for part of your day. The stories that Zach Fleming has done since we first covered this issue on Friday night have all been in response to your texts or emails. We would love to continue hearing from us. Uh, sorry continue hearing from you. Text us 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. A lot of you emailing with your stories. Checkpoint at RadioNZ.co.nz. Uh, Nona is next with business news and then we're going to Gaza. But before it all, Katrina Batten has stormed in because we were uncharacteristically on time, Katrina. That's right. With, yes. with <coughs> the 5.30 headlines. Thank you very much. An organisation helping first home buyers says the government's cap for affordable homes in Auckland is still challenging. Kiwi Build aims to build 100,000 affordable homes over the next decade, but a three bedroom home in Auckland would cost $650,000. Housing Minister Phil Twyford admits that's still too much for many. Leslie Harris from the online First Home Buyers Club says banks are also tight on lending and buyers would have to earn $115,000 a year and have no student debt. A state-owned enterprise, Airways, says it's scaremongering to suggest a plane could crash because air traffic controllers aren't entitled to toilet breaks. Air traffic controllers say people are at risk at eight regional airports where there's only one controller on duty. But Tim Boyle says the chances of a Mayday call during a controller's toilet break are incredibly slim. Meanwhile, Briscoe's admits some of its stores have not correctly rostered staff for cashing up and it will fully reimburse those, inf those in affected. The Workplace Relations Minister is warning employers to pay the minimum wage or get a visit from labour inspectors. A workers' advocate has publicly shamed employers advertising jobs on the Backpacker Board website at below $16.50 an hour. Ian Lees Galloway says employers must follow the law and meet their obligations. The Reserve Bank building in Wellington has been evacuated after traces of asbestos was found. Spokesperson uh, Angus Barclay says Level 1 was evacuated yesterday and staff walked out of the entire building today as a precaution. He says an air test done has since come back clear, but the whole building will be checked before staff can return, possibly not till Friday. Activist Penny Bright is going to meet Auckland Council tomorrow in a last-ditch attempt to stop the forced sale of her home to cover unpaid rates. The High Court today dismissed her attempt to halt the court-ordered sale process while a judicial hearing is carried out. Ms Bright says she'll consider entering into an arrangement which would defer the rates payment until she sells or passes away. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Katrina Batten, who is finished by the time we normally start. I apologise for being on time. Yeah, thanks. thank you. Thank you for that apology. John. It's, it's absolutely rude <laughs> and almost unprecedented. Thanks, <laughs> Katrina. See you in uh, 27 minutes. Uh, let's turn to business news now with Nona Peltier. Nona, life insurance companies have been wrapped over the knuckles for offering lucrative perks to financial advisors to meet sales targets. Yeah. Good wrapping, deserved. What's this all about? Well, we've heard about this for a while, how uh, customers or clients of life insurers have been advised to change their policies when it really wasn't in their best interest because sometimes when you move your policy you lose some of your advantages it just doesn't make a lot of sense but a lot of these advisors have been incentivized to do so and the and the incentive is about the sign up right yeah, so rather the, than being mm. a share of the premiums you pay over the right. lifetime of the policy right so the more signings so you uh, get yeah. the more incentives you and receive. And so if you moved around, if you can persuade Nona to go to one and then to another yeah. and to another. Now, the life and health insurance companies have been investigated. They uh, named nine of them, paid $34 million in incentives over a two-year period. And more than half of that was for travel, you know, trips to really, you know, conferences no, no, or holidays. No, nine, nine advisors or nine Nine what? insurance companies paid $34 million. Ah, in incentives. To... Uh, uh, as commission and or soft commissions. So in addition to the financial commission you get for selling a policy to somebody, you also got these soft commissions, which were pretty much travel and other kinds of perks. Now, interestingly, uh, there was one particular company that stopped offering these travel uh, deals, and that company uh, specifically saw their sales drop by a third. So there's definitely a relationship between these incentives, soft commissions, 
and the you know sale of these policies some of which people really were ill-advised to take but we're getting the wrong advice so the financial markets authority are coming down on these folks they're going to be meeting with them and saying stop that it's a fascinating question this and uh, you're not going to know the answer to it but if someone is selling your life insurance policy are you able to say to them what is your commission what is your incentive of for course. selling me this and they are required to tell you the truth well you can't lie no. and you can't mislead it's right. against uh, the rules I mean there are regulations covering yeah, financial yeah. service advisors right. they have to disclose fees and they have to disclose I guess potentially they'd have to disclose the commission that Great. they're making ask that question why not okay a2 uh, sorry the share market fell sharply after uh, an earnings update from market leader a2 milk yes and it was a really good one too so a2 milk it came up with their nine um, nine month uh, update on sales and they they told the market hey our sales rose 70 that's seven zero percent that's an awful big uh, oh, increase in sales over a nine month period over the year before now over the last say year or even this year I think it is actually this year their sale price rose uh, share price rose 60 percent mm. it's just incredible you know rise up to become the largest listed company in New Zealand to 10 billion dollars so th this has been a darling of the market and so despite that they you know gave this really quite you know, very good result for nine months, and said that they were on target to achieve full year sales increase of again seventy some percent. The market said, "Well, that's not good enough," and so their share price fell more than twenty percent. At the worst, it was How twenty two bizarre. percent down. Is that that old adage? What does it buy in the room is sell on the fact? That's it? pretty much yeah, it. That's yeah. really yeah. The market definitely got ahead of themselves in this one. Now, at the end of the day, though, that the share price did improve somewhat because, as uh, we mentioned earlier this week. A2 Milk was had entered into this MSCI index of New Zealand, which is a, an index That's of right. seven companies. Yep. These are our top companies in New Zealand, which uh, institutional investors typically invest in. So they were looking to buy these shares anyway, so I guess some of them got quite a bargain. And others took profits. So that was well crazy. Anyway, in the end, A2 Milk sh um, share price, uh, well, it fell nearly 14% at the close. So it lost a dollar eighty over the day, and uh, that dragged, of course, the New Zealand really? Top Fifty Index down. It was down more than two percent at one point, but ended down uh, nearly one point eight percent. That's one hundred and fifty three points to eight thousand five hundred and fifty five, and our dollar was steady, a little bit lower against the U.S. because of uh, very strong retail sales there and. Uh, likelihood of more interest rate hikes. So 68.7 US cents, but fairly steady against the Australian at 91.8. That's 91.8 and 50.8 pence. Nona Peltier, thank you very much indeed. Nona, it's coming up to 22 minutes to six. Palestinians have been burying their dead after Israeli forces killed up to 60 people along the Gaza-Israel border during demonstrations against the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. The U.N. Security Council has today held a special meeting on the Israeli action which has sparked international condemnation. But while the diplomats talk in New York, in Gaza, the violence and tragedy of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict has played out across another painful day. The BBC's Jeremy Bowen is there and reports from Gaza. On the border, the soundtrack was anti-Israeli songs, not gunfire. 24 hours after the killing, the big protests have stopped. But tires were burning and Palestinians looked warily towards the Israeli positions. Enterprising traders brought refreshments. So what's next? The Israelis deal with the international political fallout. The Palestinians have 60 dead. Politicians and diplomats abroad call for peace, but real peace talks ended, failed, a long time ago. And with the current generation of the Palestinian and Israeli leaders, there is no chance of them being revived. The Israelis started firing tear gas. The crowd, by then, including many families, was getting too big. And the young men were getting too close to the border wire. On the other side, the Israelis say they're in the right. 
we are not here looking to create casualties of Palestinians. That is not our aim. We are simply here to defend what is ours. We are defending our sovereignty, our civilians that live in, cl in uh, close proximity against an onslaught led by a terrorist organization that is using civilians in order to uh, penetrate into Israel. Much of Gaza's rage is born in places like Beach Camp, still a home for refugees 70 years after more than 700,000 Palestinians fled or were forced out of their homes by newly independent Israel. Palestinians call it Nakba, catastrophe. 70% of Palestinians in Gaza are refugees, stuck fast in history. At the Al Farouk Mosque, Yazan Tobasi's funeral was much quieter than his death, shot through the eye during the protests. His body was wrapped in the Hamas flag. He was 23 and his friends were there to bury him. There were tender moments. Israel says it told them to stay away from the border and Hamas is responsible for what happened. His friend Mohammed al Barawi said Yazan had worked at the hospital without pay because of Gaza's collapsing economy. Poverty and grief breed anger. At Shifa, the main hospital, wounded men were being transferred to Egypt for surgery. Inside, they were still treating casualties from the protest. All day, I've been asking Palestinians if Hamas forced them to risk their lives at the protests. No one said yes. I did it because Jerusalem is Palestinian, said Wadir Aras, unemployed, 24 years old. This is the busiest time at the hospital since the 2014 war. As a human being, I, I speak, it's, 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 it's horrible to think about it. If you see to, uh, yesterday the uh, situation, it's, it's horrible. Crying, bloody, pain, painful. What's happening? After the protests, it seems that many people are hoping for some kind of turning point. But the fundamentals of this conflict don't change. The BBC's Jeremy Bowen reporting from Gaza. It's coming up to 18 minutes to six. A lot of feedback coming in on the interview with David Reddy about Gloria Vale. Thanks for your sensitive and beautiful interview with David. Amazing young man. I hope he gets the biggest hug from his mum next week, says Maureen from Auckland. The interview just now with David was heartbreaking and gave me tears. What a fine young man. I pray he will get to see his mum next week, says Mary. Graham says, come on, John, the subject needs hearing. But the guy's only just been buried. Time to speak ill of the dead now. And you such a sensitive guy. And RJ says, I love this guy. He got out of the cult. Religion is the opium of the, uh, well, he says opinion. I think it was opiate, wasn't it, of the masses. There is no God. He is a very strong man. Thank you all for your feedback. And we are hearing from more people about being required to work for part of your day without pay. And we will keep following that up. We're in Minganui soon, but just before then, a pilot in China is being hailed a hero for safely landing a plane after a terrifying media drama. The cockpit windscreen on the Sichuan Airlines flight with 119 passengers on board blew out at 32,000 feet, sucking the co-pilot halfway out. CNN's Linda Kincaid has more. Frightening moments for passengers and crew aboard a flight over China. At 10,000 metres, the jet's cockpit windshield shattered, sucking the co-pilot halfway out of the aircraft, according to Chinese state media. Sichuan Airlines Flight 3U8633 was headed from the southern city of Chongqing to the capital of Tibet, Lhasa, when the Airbus A319 was forced to make an emergency landing. The co-pilot and a flight attendant suffered minor injuries. Although none of the 119 passengers on board were hurt, some described a terrifying scene as the incident happened as meals were being served. I suddenly heard a bang from the top of the plane, very loud. It sounded like the air was pushed into the plane. The whole cabin then went dark, and oxygen masks dropped from the ceiling. Then the plane started to drop, but not for long before it was stabilized again. Once they landed, the pilot and crew were greeted with flowers and applause and were praised by passengers for landing the plane safely. I just want to thank the flight crew. All of the crew members were very responsible during the incident, as well as after we landed. They all did what they needed to during the incident and told us a lot about the security measures. No word yet on the possible cause of the shattered windshield, but officials say an investigation is underway.
Scene and transportation analyst Mary Schiavo says a damaged plane windshield is more common than you might think. A cockpit window cracking is actually a weekly event on commercial flights. And if you include private aviation, it's probably a daily event when you look at the events all over the world. And usually, of course, it does not turn into this kind of a disaster because of the many layers that comprise an aircraft windscreen. The incident comes nearly a month after the death of a woman who was partially sucked out of a window that broke during a Southwest Airlines flight over the U.S. That report from CNN. Of all the government's new initiatives, perhaps the Regional Development Fund or Provincial Growth Fund owes the most to a coalition partner sense where the cheques need to be written and cashed. This was a New Zealand first baby with a billion dollars per annum and we wanted to look at its application. So we went to the Bay of Plenty forestry village of Minganui. In March, Shane Jones, the Minister of Regional Economic Development, allocated almost $6 million to the Minganui nursery. It's precisely the kind of spending talked about when the fund was launched. But some locals say if the economically depressed village is to bounce back, funding needs to be directed into the dire state of housing and a lack of infrastructure. So is it working? And is the money going to the right place? To Manu Kōrehi reporter John Boynton and visual journalist Dan Cook went to Minganui to look for themselves. There's a mist that has draped itself heavily over the former forestry village of Minganui for the last 30 years. The small Bay of Plenty community in the Firinaki Conservation Park is about one and a half hours drive southeast of Rotorua. And it has become the poster child for small towns swept aside by the winds of social economic change. Minginui was created as a forestry town in the 1940s, but the privatisation of forest services in the 1980s crippled the small village. Around 300 people still call Minginui home and the Minginui nursery is hoping to create positive change and bring the community back to life. Nazi Whare Group Chairman Bronco Carson says the funding allows for the fast-tracking of the nursery's expansion. Our aspiration was bringing in employment to Minginui, um, setting up a, a platform for that creation of, of employment and that's what this nursery has done. It's, it's the start of uh, hopefully a, a a lot of other things to come. The funding will help to grow almost one million native trees at the nursery and is expected to create 90 jobs for the community. Bronco Carson says he's not concerned about moving people who have been without work for the last three decades back into the workforce. Contrary to commentary outside of here, um, our people are willing to work, um, as you can see for yourself with those that are already here. The person responsible for hiring will be Mere George, the general manager of Nazi Whare Holdings. We've got a generation of people within the community that um, have been have, were part of the Forest Service days and so um, the skills have been able to be transferred and we've got a new generation that are wanting to learn some of those skills. Mere George says eight more employees have been hired since the funding announcement. She says workers will have the opportunity to start on minimum wage and move into more senior and administrative positions. This is about creating an economy, helping um, be a change agent in our community to, I guess, show people that, that they don't actually have to leave, that there is a career, there opportunity, there is jobs. It takes a couple of minutes to loop around the horseshoe design of Minginui Village. The two lone reminders of a once bustling hub is a long abandoned local store with its mint green paint peeling off and the local post office. There's no gas station, local eatery, sports club or even a dairy. Local Komatsua Wahiri Iraya says when the forestry services closed, Minginui was left in a state of limbo. In my father's and them's time, they thought that that was the be all and all was that sort of money. But when the trees, when they, when the trees were depleted, the, the resource was depleted, nobody wanted to know us. He remembers the pride people had in their homes in a community that was able to look after each other. I can still vision seeing Natamaliki. You could go into a home. The first thing that people say, Haramaitakai. You know you get a kai. You can't do this today. Everybody's too poor. He's already starting to see the positive change the nursery is bringing and believed in the direction the Nazi whare runanga was taking. When I look around at them as they work, 
I see a different person. His cousin, Meredu Mason, also has fond memories of what Mingi Nui used to be like. Everything looked nice, you know. Um, everything was really lovely to come into the village and see things all done up nice, the lawns all done, gardens and the trees all cut. You know, it was a beautiful little village. And she still feels the burden of when all of that was taken away. What was it like to see the community disintegrate, I guess, or fall apart? And It was sad, it was sad. People cried when they came home. Meredu Mason is hoping the nursery can bring jobs and people back home, but she wonders what to. What are they going to come home to? Those houses over there have to be fixed. If those houses were fixed, I think everyone will come home. They can't come home and live with cousin or auntie or mum and dad again. They want to come home and live with their children in their own homes. Te Kura Toitsu o Te Whaiti Nui Atoi is the local school, which also acts as the hub for high-speed broadband in Mingi Nui. The school's principal, Josephine Gage, says the community has heard its fair share of promises from government officials and ministers in the past. Someone might come in and paint a roof, and the next person, next sort of group might come in and you know put some um, insulation under the houses, but all in all our houses remain the same. <clears throat> they look the same, so, and um, yeah, nothing, nothing much changed. Nothing much has changed, really, not since I've moved, been back. And she's cautious about the latest funding injection from the government, and wonders about the long-term sustainability of returning to the forestry industry. I think we're going to look at anything rather than um, than forestry. We should be looking at food, agriculture, because that seems to be where everything's going. Um, you know. The Chinese economy is going to be, they're going to be looking for places to grow food soon. And I don't think they're going to eat trees. Back at the nursery, workers are separating seeds collected from the forest floor of Te Whirinaki Te Pua Atane Conservation Park. Clayton Willoughby moved to Minginui from Porirua to live with his partner's whānau, and he says the job beats sitting on the couch. It's actually been good having a job up here, sitting here for around six months to seven months with no job, but then this pops up for everyone to get an opportunity to get a job, get their life on track and everything. Yeah, Better. it's been good. Local Minginui resident Te Aue August is growing into her new role. I've been finding it very good. You know, it's something new for us to learn about our nahiri as, as well as the seeds, where our trees come from. And you can see the nursery playing a significant role in rebuilding the community. For this nursery to come, you know, it's brought a light over our village now. Things are starting to happen, you know, people are starting to walk their talk. The nursery will grow a million trees a year over the next three years to contribute towards the government's plans to plant a billion trees in the next 10 years. Mo te hōtaka o te ahi pōnei, ko John Boynton aho. You can watch that story uh, online, we'll put it up uh, very shortly. Well, let's go from Minganui to Malaysia, where the country's likely next Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim, has been released from prison after two stints in jail, totalling 11 years. His lawyer says Mr Anwar wants to lead his country and should be in the top job within the next one or two years, just as soon as Malaysia's new leader, Mahathir Mohamad, steps aside. Looking at all of this is the ABC's Adam Harvey. His political ally, MP Ong Kian Ming, says Anwar will soon join the government coalition. I think he's uh, sacrificed a lot for this country. He's spent a lot of time in jail twice uh, over uh, the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, his experience uh, as former Deputy Prime Minister and former Finance Minister, as well as his uh, dedication to introducing reforms in this country, I think will be very much welcome. Anwar's legal advisor, Siva Rasa, says the pardon is the first step on his road back to politics. Uh, it'll be as if that conviction never existed, and he's free physically, and he's also free politically. Dr Mahathir in the past has said that he will eventually hand over the reins of power to Mr Anwar. Yes. Do you trust him? I think the, the question of a lack of trust, which is what the question implies, yeah, uh, doesn't really arise here. I mean, they all have their history. They were, they were partners in politics in Amno once for a long time, good friends, and then they became bitter political enemies. And they reunited politically 
uh, on a common purpose, which was to get rid of Amno and uh, Najib, which they succeeded. He could pull the rug away from under Mr. Ammar's feet, couldn't he? In politics, anything is possible. So, it's, it's, Dr. Mahathir is not working in his old context of, you know, Amno with a massive majority and so on. Uh, but we're realistic, yes. We know he may be influenced by other people. We'll be ready for that. But uh, my, my, my gut feeling and tells me that he will stick by the manifesto and he, he's already indicated he's not going to be there forever. Mr Anwar could be the next Prime Minister of the country. He will be. Does he want to be? He does want to be. He's been through a lot, 11 years in prison. Well, Politics has cost him almost everything. Absolutely. I'm sure he wants to be the next Prime Minister. Uh, it's just that I think he will give Dr Mahathir the space he needs to, give, he needs, he needs to have. And I, and I think Mahathir is quite clear that you know, he's not going to be there. Uh, for too long. Uh, Anwar deserves his turn. It's possible that the man many hold responsible for Mr Anwar's most recent stint in prison, former Prime Minister Najib Razak, will himself eventually go to jail. Two corruption reports have already been lodged against Mr Najib. He's banned from leaving the country pending the investigations. Anwar Ibrahim, quite a remarkable story. Adam Harvey, uh, the reporter there. Just before we go to the news at six, a uh, clamour from Checkpoint listeners. What's happening on the Royal Wedding? You're all asking, so let's update you. You'll never know whether that's true or not. Thomas Markle wouldn't be the first commoner to find himself caught up in the whirlwind of royalty and finding it hard to stay afloat. Just a few days out from his daughter Meghan's, or Megan, or however you say it, wedding to Prince Harry, there's a will he or won't he guessing game about whether he will walk her down the aisle. I know. And there are also questions about why he appears to be facing a very public shaming or whether he deserves it. But what's a royal wedding without a bit of drama? So here you are, ladies and gentlemen, the latest from the ABC's Lisa Miller. This is a spring tradition, garden parties at the palace. Invitations sent to a broad selection of people across the UK, charities and volunteers, magistrates and police officers. They sip cups of tea and eat cucumber sandwiches. The men in top hats, the women equally well attired. Um, I think seeing the Queen was very memorable, as I've never met her before. The food was lovely. No queues? <laughs> no queues. It's been lovely all round. Weather, everything. And are you interested or excited about the wedding this weekend? Oh, really excited. We're having a big party, everything. Mega excited. Do you know that an opinion poll came out saying two-thirds of Britons weren't interested in the wedding? No way. <laughs> Good God. Kayleigh, you're having a party, aren't you? Sean, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah? No, we're all having parties. So you don't we're believe all... that? No, I don't believe that for one moment. Buckingham Palace is the home of the older generation of royals. At Kensington Palace, the frantic pre-wedding rush is on. Prince Harry and his bride were reportedly caught unaware by Thomas Markle's decision to out himself to the celebrity website TMZ as a photo fraudster, admitting he'd staged the paparazzi shots of him being fitted for a suit and looking at his daughter online. Embarrassed, he said he wouldn't come to Windsor for the wedding. A day later, and apparently he's had a change of heart and says he would like to come to the wedding, except he's in hospital with chest pains following a heart attack last week. There have been no further comments from Kensington Palace after a brief one line yesterday which asked for respect and understanding. Royal watcher Victoria Arbiter says the royals will understand what Meghan Markle is going through. I think they'll be keen to sort of gather around Meghan and make her feel supported, make her feel comforted because of course this isn't her fault, her family's not her fault, but it does of course illustrate perfectly all the reasons as to why she hadn't extended the family at large. But history is littered with people who've tangled with royalty and come off the loser. And royal reporter Camilla Tomini has some empathy for a man who was so suddenly in the spotlight. Five minutes ago he was a reclusive man living a quiet life in New Mexico and now he's been absolutely plunged into the limelight and he's clearly very uncomfortable with that and I think a lot of people will sympathise with his position. But the Queen and her husband have seen their share of turmoil over the years and it's hard to imagine they'd be happy with the current string of headlines. Prince Harry and his new bride will make their first official appearance as a married couple next week, starting work, as it were, rather than heading off on a honeymoon. They're conscious they've all still got a PR job to perform. That was for you, Laurie Fleming and Jared Gilbert. You love it. 
You know you love it. Uh, just before six, Nick Williams from Christchurch says, I have now retired after 30 years in the tourism industry, including customer service training and career advising. The three companies I worked for were all 24 seven day companies, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including a major airline staff, regularly had meetings and training sessions which were not paid for. The payment issue never arose because staff enjoyed their work and their attitudes were that meetings were personally beneficial and many meetings had team building issues. It seems to me that staff now seem to work just for money, the fun and enjoyment and personal responsibility having disappeared. While some companies have excellent staff relations, it seems to be a sad time for the retail sales industry. Thank you and thanks those of you who have been in touch with us about your jobs. RNZ News at 6. Ngā mihi nui. Good evening. Ko Katrina Bat in Aho. Airways says it's scaremongering to suggest there could be a plane crash because air traffic controllers aren't entitled to brakes. Air traffic controllers today warned MPs considering the Employment Relations Bill that the flying public is being placed at risk at eight regional airports where there's just one controller on duty. The Airline Pilots Association says the worst case scenario is that there's a mayday call while the sole air traffic controller is in the bathroom with no one to cover for them. But Airways General Manager of Air Traffic Services, Tim Boyle, says that's not fair. The chances, as I said, of, a, of an accident occurring uh, as a result of a controller being on a nature break uh, is incredibly, incredibly slim. And so I do think the comment is, is perhaps a little bit scaremongering, yes. Airways Air Traffic Services Manager Tim Boyle. The Briscoes Group has admitted that some staff haven't been paid properly. RNZ News has been reporting that workers from Smith City, Spotlight and Briscoes have been forced to go to unpaid morning meetings. Briscoe says all its stores have confirmed that staff attending those meetings are paid to be there. But it says some stores have failed to correctly roster staff for cashing up at the end of the day. Briscoe says it's always been its intention to pay staff for the work they do and staff affected by the error will be fully reimbursed. A former Gloria Vale member says family and friends have been sexually abused by members of the community. David Reddy also says that one of the abusers was the leader, convicted sex offender, Hopeful Christian. Christian, also known as Neville Cooper, died yesterday at the age of 92. David Reddy told Checkpoint he was expelled from Gloria Vale in 2016 after confronting Christian about his criminal past and other leaders about sexual assaults. It's happened to my friends, it's happened to some of my family members, and I know what's happened and I know the people that did it. I know when it happened. The leaders knew everything and they refused to take action. Former Gloria Vale member David Reddy. An organisation helping first home buyers says the government's cap for affordable homes in Auckland is still challenging. The government's Kiwi Build program aims to build 100,000 affordable houses over the next decade. A three bedroom home in Auckland would cost $650,000. The Housing Minister Phil Twyford has admitted it's still too much for many people. Leslie Harris from the online help organisation the First Home Buyers Club says it's a significant cost and banks are also tight on lending. She says people are having to get creative to afford housing. A hastily drafted bill to help farmers who are struggling with mounting debt is a last minute addition to the lineup in Parliament tonight. It includes a provision to remove the current $200,000 cap on compensation. The New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters flagged support for farmers during a debate about the mycoplasma, the mycoplasma bovis outbreak last week. His MP Mark Patterson says it's designed to be a circuit breaker in the event of liquidation or receivership. A cooling down period, it gives farmers an extra layer of protection in what is a very, very vulnerable period. The New Zealand First MP, Mark Patterson. The head of the Financial Markets Authority is taking aim at insurance companies for spending tens of millions of dollars on perks for advisors who hit sales targets. Financial advisors are legally obliged to act in the best interests of their clients at all times. But an FMA report says nine insurance companies spent nearly $35 million on incentives like overseas trips and business support for advisors. The FMA's Director of Regulation, Liam Mason, says that could compromise the quality of advice consumers get. You're called a financial advisor. You have a, an ongoing relationship with the customer to service them and to give them ongoing advice and to make sure that it continues to meet their needs. If incentives were balanced to ensure that that ongoing advice was high quality, as opposed to putting it all into that upfront sale, then we probably wouldn't have such an issue. Liam Mason, the Director of Regulation at the Financial Markets Authority. 
An Auckland man who severely damaged seven native trees despite knowing he didn't have a resource consent to do so has had his appeal against a prison sentence dismissed. I Kuo Lau, also known as Augustine Lau, gave instructions to a contractor to fell the trees on rural property in Waiwera in 2014. Jesse Chang reports. The property developer is a repeat offender, removing plants and being served enforcement orders for unauthorised dwellings and wastewater charges. Lau was sentenced to prison for two months and two weeks by Judge Keller for the tree felling. The Court of Appeal said in a decision released today that a longer prison term would have been justified. It said Lau's offending was cynical and deliberate, and his track record showed his disdain for environmental rules. Call Jesse Chang TNA. It's five minutes past six. Sport, despite three wins from 11 games this Super Rugby season, the Blues today announced they have extended head coach Tana Umanga's contract till the end of 2019. He'll be joined by former Crusaders attacking coach and former All Blacks teammate Leon McDonnell as his, assistants, as, his, as his assistant in a desperate bid to finally produce successful results. Umanga says although he's aware he's working in a result-driven industry, it isn't the only challenge he's faced with. You know, we're a very proud club uh, who has legacy and we want to make sure, we, we want to improve on that. We want to get it back to what it was, there's no doubt about that. So the pressure on us here is, uh, it's the same, you know, whether it's now, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's next year, next month. Tana Umanga. The Greymouth squash player Paul Cole has a tough assignment in his second round match at the British Open in Hull tomorrow morning. Cole scored an encouraging win over an English qualifier this morning but now faces seventh seed Karim Abdel Gawad. The Egyptian player was ranked at number one in the world a year ago, however Cole has beaten him in the past. Meanwhile, Joel King plays her second round match on Friday. The Auckland motor racing driver Scott Dixon was fifth fastest as the official start of practice for the Indianapolis 500 got underway today. Dixon, who's fourth in the IndyCar Championship standings, was 0.25 of a second off the pace. The Indy 500 is in 10 days' time. That's the news. Tonight on Nights... We have a window on the world of the West as seen through the eyes of lost tribes of Amazon Indians. Nick Tipping's playing Kiwi Jazz on Inside Out, which will go nicely with this week's sofa session, featuring the sly guitar and sly vocals of Thomas Oliver. And stay informed at the other end of the day. Join me for Lately, an hour-long show that includes the extended 10pm news bulletin and is across music, the arts, politics, live events and current affairs. Keep up to date with Lately with Karen Hay, 10 to 11 weeknights on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow for all of the North Island except Gisborne and Hawke's Bay. Showers, some heavy and isolated thunderstorms easing tomorrow. Becoming fine from tomorrow afternoon about Bay of Plenty and Taupo and from Horafenua to Wellington and Wairarapa. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, a few showers about the ranges, otherwise mostly fine. Nelson and Buller, rain with heavy falls and possible thunderstorms clearing this afternoon, but a few showers remaining about Buller and Western Nelson. Westland and Fiordland, mainly fine in Westland today, but showers in Fiordland spreading north tomorrow. Marlborough and Canterbury, rain about and north of Christchurch and a few showers elsewhere, all clearing early tomorrow morning and becoming fine. Otago and Southland, showers retreating to coastal Southland tonight, then spreading north into Southland for a time tomorrow afternoon. And for the Chatham Islands, occasional showers clearing later tomorrow. It's eight and a half past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. And thank you everyone with your magnificently poisonous opinions about any coverage whatsoever of the royal wedding. Uh, whoop de doo <laughs> the latest text says. Brilliant. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a fascinating issue, this one, so let's move on to it. Auckland is earning less than six figures are unlikely to be able to buy one of the government's Kiwi built homes. The Kiwi built program aims to build 100,000 affordable houses over the next decade, half of which are supposed to be in Auckland. But the government admitted this week that the price tag for a three bedroom Kiwi built house in the country's largest city has risen to about $650,000. Property experts say that's a big mountain for first home buyers to scale in terms of deposit and servicing the debt. Tom Fairley reports. 
If you were to move out of the big smoke and settle in the Lower North Island and Palmerston North, $650,000 would go a long way. You could actually purchase a brand new property in the Manawatu Palmerston North area for 640000 and that would be low maintenance, double glaze, all the warranties, bells and whistles. Um, and, you know, so you, you, you're talking top end stuff. That's Andy Stewart from the Real Estate Institute. He says first home buyers can expect to pay anywhere from 250 to 400,000 for a nice place in Manawatu. Auckland mortgage broker Bruce Patton says the first home buyers he deals with in East Auckland, while often on middle to higher incomes, often need financial help from family and are spending way above that amount. There's nothing in our area that you'd buy for less than about 758. Yeah, and we're talking that would be a unit, two bedrooms joined to something else. So they're, they're taking significant mortgages to be able to get that. But at the same time, their probably average income, you know, combined income would be, you know, 150000 plus. It's that shortage of affordable housing the government is hoping to help remedy with its flagship KiwiBuild program. With the high cost of building and land, KiwiBuild now considers the affordable price tag for a three-bedroom home in Auckland is $650,000. Housing Minister Phil Twyford has acknowledged that that is still too much for many people. Bruce Patton says while it's more affordable than the average price of a million dollars in Auckland, it does effectively cut out single people or couples earning less than six figures combined. For a single couple with no children and no other debt, they would still need an excess of $100,000 combined income to borrow 90% on a $650,000 purchase price. So it's still relatively speaking, what I would consider not overly affordable. Bruce Patton says mortgage payments would be roughly $3,000 a month or more than $700 a week. The average household income nationwide is nearly $100,000 before tax. A spokesperson for online help service, the First Home Buyers Club, Leslie Harris, says banks have also tightened lending this year. People can't have debt. That if they're needing to service a mortgage and they need 114000 to say service a $500,000 mortgage, if they only have 112000 chances are they'll actually be declined by the bank. So that's a very, very, very different landscape to what we've seen a number of years ago. Leslie Harris says many people are putting off having children or relying on family money to cover costs. So you can see just the need and in some cases just a real desperation and a bit of despair in terms of how are we ever actually going to get on that property market. You know, in Auckland we're seeing some levelling but there's no real signs of things stopping or significantly going backwards. However, Miss Harris says it's not impossible and first home buyers are still managing to save their pennies and get a foot on the property ladder, even if it's a lowly one. In Auckland for Checkpoint, this is Tom Furley. Self-styled anti-corruption campaigner Penny Bright says she's been pushed into a corner and will likely end up compromising with Auckland Council over the forced sale of her home. Ms Bright owes the council nearly $89,000 in unpaid rates, penalties and legal fees, so it's selling her million dollar house in order to recover costs. In a last ditch attempt, Ms Bright asked the High Court in Auckland on Monday to stop the court imposed sale of her home. But as Sally Murphy explained, she found out this morning that request has been denied. for 28 years. I bought the house because I really liked it. This is where I'm based. This is from where I work. This is my one and only asset. I, I, I don't deserve to be financially ruined when I'm not the bad guy here. I'm not a bad person. Penny Bright was clearly distraught following the High Court decision this morning. She's lived at her Morningside property since she paid $140,000 for it in 1990. It now has a rating valuation of $1.4 million. It was always my intention to pay outstanding rates, but what I was trying to do was to help make a fuss mm. over the issue of where exactly a rates money is being spent on private sector consultants and contractors. That's the reason Miss Bright has not paid her rates for the past 11 years. She wants the council to be more transparent. She concedes she's lost the legal fight and now will work towards a postponement arrangement with the Auckland Council, which would defer the payment of rates until Miss Bright sells her home or passes away. I feel as that I'm under total duress, but this rating sale... Um, I, as far as I'm concerned, it can't continue and I've arranged to have 
a meeting tomorrow at three o'clock with Auckland Council. Miss Bright says she has stage three ovarian cancer and wants to settle with the council so she can focus on her health. In the High Court decision released today, Justice Down says Miss Bright's circumstances are unfortunate but are all her own doing. Justice Down says there is very little prospect a judicial review would succeed. Auckland Council's lawyer James Hassel says it's sad to hear of Miss Bright's health issues and would prefer for her to stay in her own home. Mr Hassel says the council is looking forward to meeting Miss Bright tomorrow in the hope that the matter can finally be resolved. In Auckland for Checkpoint, Sally Murphy. Perhaps not entirely unexpectedly, North Korea has thrown into question an unprecedented summit between its leader Kim Jong-un and US President Donald Trump scheduled for next month. The reclusive state has denounced military exercises between South Korea and the US as provocation and is calling off high-level talks with Seoul. Jonah Green reports. North Korea said on Wednesday it had no choice but to suspend high-level talks with South Korea due to U.S.-South Korean military exercises that went against the trend of warming North-South ties. I'll be meeting with Kim Jong-un. South Korean news agency Yonhap reported that the North also threatened to cancel the upcoming June 12th summit with President Donald Trump. Though on Tuesday, the U.S. State Department said for now they would operate on the assumption that the summit was still on. I don't want to get ahead of this announcement that everybody's all worked up about until we have some time to take a look at things, OK? It was only last Thursday when President Trump welcomed home three Korean-American prisoners released from North Korea, with the U.S. president thanking Kim Jong-un for the overture. But now talks with the South are on ice. The meeting between the North and the South, scheduled for later on Wednesday, was due to focus on how to implement a declaration from the extraordinary inter-Korean summit in April, including promises to formally end the Korean War and pursue complete denuclearization, according to the South. North Korea's official news agency called the joint U.S.-Korean military exercises a, quote, intentional military provocation running counter to the positive political development on the Korean peninsula and said Pyongyang had no choice but to suspend the talks. That report from Reuters. Home again, air traffic controllers are worried there could be a major disaster if they're not allowed to take proper breaks. They want a law change to enable them to take rest, meal and toilet breaks and warned MPs that the flying public is being placed at risk. Political reporter Benedict Collins has more. MPs are hearing submissions on the government's employment relations bill, which would restore statutory rest and meal breaks and roll back changes made to collective bargaining and union rights. But the Airline Pilots Association told them that air traffic controllers are exempt from mandatory rest and meal breaks and says that has considerable safety implications at the country's eight solo watchtowers. An air traffic controller, Calvin Verco, who has worked at Nelson and Blenheim airports, described what could go wrong. The worst case scenario would be uh, an aircraft calling a mayday while you've got your pants around your ankles. Some of these control towers have the toilet outside the, the security zone, so there's, there's, there's procedures and, and time involved in getting to the toilet. Airline Pilots Association President Tim Robinson says there's an easy solution. So what happens overseas is there's generally more than one air traffic controller in the tower that enables those air traffic controllers that have got sole watch to have the brakes that's required. Uh, and that works very, very well. Um, we realise air traffic control in New Zealand is an essential service, but these air traffic controllers have got to be provided with brakes, um, uh, you know, to, to get adequate rest, to get some fresh air, even to go to the toilet. And at the moment that's very, very difficult. Yeah, do you think it's dangerous what's happening? Yeah. We think it is. We, we, we think that the, it's, it's potential flight safety risk. The General Manager of Air Traffic Services at the state-owned air traffic controller Airways, Tim Boyle, says that's not fair. The chances, as I said, of, a, of an accident occurring uh, as a result of a controller being on a nature break uh, is incredibly, incredibly slim. And so I do think the comment is, is perhaps a little bit scaremongering, yes. Mr Boyle says he's a bit surprised the Airline Pilots Association even brought the matter up. I spend time in the towers, all of those eight around the country from time to time, and it's not a topic of conversation. It's not been raised as, a, as an issue uh, within any of those visits. They don't have their uh, legs cross-busting to go when, uh, when you're in the towers with them? Uh, no, and, uh, and the reality, though, um, Benedict, is that um, in, in our towers, and we're talking our regional towers here, because in, in the regions, the reality is that there are long periods of time, um, 30 to 40 minutes at a time, when there is no traffic. You know, some of these airports are, are very, very quiet. The Workplace Relations Minister, Ian Lees Galloway, says the government will look into it. Obviously we listen to all the submissions that come in and, and 
we take them into consideration. One of the concerns about having uh, a, more, um, a more stringent approach to rest and meal breaks was that it would not have the flexibility for those emergency services or services that we, we need to have people on the, on the desk uh, at, at all times. So, um, look, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Mr Les Galloway says he also hopes the association and Airways can reach an agreement between themselves on the matter. The eight solo watchtowers are at Invercargill, Dunedin, Woodburn, Napier, Rotorua, Gisborne, New Plymouth and Whanuapai airports. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Benedict Collins. Tom Wolfe, one of the pioneers of what's been called the new journalism, has died aged 88. With Gore Vidal, Joan Didion, Norman Mailer, Hunter S. Thompson and others, most of whom wrote fiction as well. Wolfe wrote from the perspective of being there, not for him the received boundaries of objectivity, being dispassionate and neutral. If he was appalled or amused, he said so. And if he could say so in ways that made the reader appalled or amused, he did exactly that. He was also an acclaimed novelist, arguably most famous for The Right Stuff and The Bonfire of the vanities and in fiction and non-fiction he chronicled the excesses, the absurdities, the vanities and the brilliance of modern American life. Here is the BBC's Vincent Dowd. In 1983 with the film of his book The Right Stuff about the early space race Tom Wolfe proved he could engage America with real life events. He'd been born in Richmond, Virginia. He later loved to play the southern dandy in white suit and Homburg hat. By 1959, Tom Wolfe was on the Washington Post. Editors had spotted a witty writer with social insight. Wolfe became the star of so-called new journalism. His subjects were pop culture, politics and anything that belonged to the post-war baby boomers. Basically a conservative, he invented the ironic phrase radical chic after seeing composer Leonard Bernstein play host to the black rights group, the Black Panthers. I saw this man living in a 19-room duplex apartment in Park Avenue and 79th Street, raising his fist and saying, right on, as the field marshal of the Black Panthers uh, announced the 10-point revolutionary program uh, under which there would be no more uh, privately owned uh, duplexes. I could not resist. I tried to bring the scene alive, let the people talk, and steer the mind of the reader, rather than pulling back and passing moral judgment. In 1980, he told the BBC he sensed an earlier ambition returning to be a novelist. I want to write a novel about New York, the city I've lived in for almost 20 years now. People will look back to this period in New York as a period whose Baroque excesses you can't help but wonder at. Now, I hope my performance in writing such a book will transcend any particular personal passions. In 1987, the result was The Bonfire of the Vanities. The book was top of the New York Times bestseller list for weeks, a real achievement for a complex social satire. The film, with Tom Hanks, failed to capture the wry tone and flopped. Justice is the law, and the law is man's feeble attempt to set down the principles of decency. Decency! And decency is not a deal. It isn't an angle or a contract or a hustle. Decency, decency is what your grandmother taught you. The novel looked at the haves of Wall Street and the media and politics and at the have-nots. Tom Wolfe didn't much like any of them. None of his later fiction matched the success of The Bonfire of the Vanities. But in that novel, Tom Wolfe had written a huge popular hit, which people will turn to decades from now to learn about the very particular America of the 1980s. Report from the BBC. Consumer New Zealand is calling for a specific type of smoke alarm banned in some countries to be pulled from shelves here. Uh, through testing, it's found ionisation smoke alarms don't pick up smoke from smouldering fires as well as their counterparts, photoelectric alarms. It says they perform poorly and is talking to retailers about getting rid of them. Laura Dooney reports. 
When asked if they knew about the difference, most Wellingtonians seem to know what type of smoke alarm they should have at home. Got the photo electronic one, I think. Yes, yeah, I've got the little swarms that last for 10 years. Just a bit of research a little while ago when we kept having to replace them. So, yeah, I don't know if everyone would know that. I have the uh, photoelectric. I googled it, just looked it up. No idea. <laughs> just the cheapest one from my to 10, I think. <laughs> like, I wouldn't think too much about it as long as it does the job eventually. But I can definitely see the merit in it, picking it up as quickly as possible. Do you know what type of fire alarm you have installed at your house? Yes. What sort? The second one. Photoelectric? Yeah, our electrician provided them as part of our rebuild, so... No idea, no. No, just a smoke alarm, I wouldn't have a clue. Nevertheless, Consumer NZ wants to see the options narrowed down from two to one. The ionisation alarms are sold at hardware stores like Mitre 10, Placemakers and Bunnings. But the head of testing, Dr Paul Smith, says the alarms are no longer being sold in some states of Australia and in other parts of the world. He says other studies have also shown they're not the most effective alarm. We're struggling to find any reason why they're still out there being sold, um, other than they, they tend to be a cheaper version. Um, so we're going out to, to the retailers and just making that point, saying, you know, this is another test that says ionisation aren't as good. We don't think you should be selling them, um, and we'd like you to remove them from the shelves. Consumers' tests did find the alarms were great at detecting flames, but not smoke, which can kill people while they sleep. But if you've already got ionisation alarms in your house, don't go taking them down after hearing this. Dr Smith says any smoke alarm is better than none. Keep those ionisation alarms in there, but we'd recommend um, if you've only got ionisation alarms to get hold of a couple of photoelectric ones and put them up with them as well, particularly in hallways and escapeways. Paul Smith says the warehouse stopped selling the alarms last year and some distributors have indicated they're phasing them out. The fire guys in Auckland install fire alarm systems in homes and businesses. The managing director, Russell Hogg, says they don't use ionisation alarms because they're obsolete. The photoelectric ones are also a lot more sensitive to fires in their early stages while they're smouldering, whereas the ionisation uh, are designed towards uh, detection of smoke given off by flames. And I guess if you're in a house, you want to know about the fire before it becomes a flame because the smoke is the biggest killer in any fire in any property. People don't generally die from the heat, they will die from smoke inhalation. He says when he worked in the UK, he used to install ionisation smoke alarms, but not for long. It was quickly found out that the photoelectric ones were far more sensitive and better for the environment as well, because it costs, you have to pay money to dispose of an ionisation once it's passed its shelf life due to its radioactive components. So yeah, we did install them, but quickly stopped and then quickly advised people to remove them and replace them for photoelectric, given the opportunity. Fire and Emergency says photoelectric alarms are generally considered to be more effective in fires in the home. In a statement, National Advisor Peter Gallagher says for more than a decade they've recommended people use long-life photoelectric smoke alarms in every bedroom, living area and hallway. He says ionisation smoke alarms are not unsafe. We asked stores about the alarms they are selling. Placemakers says all their alarms are fully compliant, but it will review selling the alarms based on the Consumer NZ report. Mitre 10 stocks mainly photoelectric alarms, with signs letting people know the difference. The shop recommends people use a combination of both types of alarm. For Checkpoint, Laura Dooney. Just before we go, we've received a huge amount of feedback about our interview at the start of the programme tonight with former Glory of our community member, David Reddy. David, whose mother is hopeful Christian's stepdaughter, was expelled from the community in September 2016 after confronting Christian about his criminal past and other leaders about sexual assaults. Uh, the interview in full is online, but David says his own friends and family members were sexually assaulted. The leaders knew everything and they refused to take action. Did Hopeful Christian know? He knew. He, but please tell me the truth here as well as you are able to. Don't let me put words in your mouth, but was he involved in any of it as far as you're aware? He was involved in one. And when I found it out about it, I was not a happy boy. Do you think that people will come out now? Do you think that your friends and family who are still in there and who you clearly love uh, will start to think about leaving Gloria Vale as a result of, of Neville Cooper, hopeful Christian dying? 
Unfortunately, I don't think that there will be any major immediate change. What would you like to say to the people you love who are still in there? I'm coming to see you next week. Will they let you in? Um, they can't stop me. <clears throat> and what are you going to do when you go? I'm going to go see my mother and take her a belated Happy Mother's Day gift. That's from a glory of our community member, David Reddy. He was sent away as a 17-year-old with just $700 and a one-way ticket uh, on a plane to Napier. The full 13-minute interview with David Reddy is online on the Checkpoint uh, uh, website page and on our Checkpoint Facebook page. Thank you for being with us. That is the programme for tonight. On behalf of our really excellent and hard-working team, uh, we hope to see you again tomorrow night at 5. RNZ news headlines at 6.30. Airways says it's scaremongering to say a plane could crash if air traffic controllers aren't allowed brakes. Tens of thousands of workers could be owed millions of dollars by 16 large retail chains accused of underpaying staff. A first home buyers club says the cap for affordable homes in Auckland is still too high. And a bill to help farmers struggling with debt is before MPs in Parliament tonight. Our next news and weather is at 7.00. This week on Are We There Yet? It's normally the two boys fighting each other where it goes bad. <laughs> Blended families. I didn't want to overstep the mark because I wasn't their mother. How to create a new family dynamic. I think if your hope is that you can squeeze your blended family into a nuclear model, then that's when the troubles start to arise. Are We There Yet? with me, Katie Gossett, is tomorrow at 3.30 during Afternoons with Jessie Mulligan. Or get it from 